Good morning, everyone. So today we are very happy to have Professor Mark van Langmusnok from University of British Columbia, UBC, as a colloquium speaker. Mark got a PhD in 2000 in University of British Columbia, and after he became a postdoc at Stanford University until 2002. And from 2002, Mark came back to UBC as an assistant professor. And from 2007, uh, he has been a professor in U UBC until now. And Mark has been an extremely famous uh, researcher in string theory, especially in the topic of holography and D brains and membranes. And in, in particular, as many of you may know, uh, he published a famous article that building up space time with quantum entanglement as an essay in 2010, which won the first prize of the essay contest by uh, Gravity Research Foundation. This is well known as the pioneer nearing work which proposed the idea of emergence of quantum space-time from quantum information. Okay, so let us invite Mark to give uh, uh, his colloquium. So title of his talk is Cosmology from Confinement. Please, Mark, start. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to give this talk. So I'm happy to tell you about some recent work that I've been thinking about. And uh, this has been in collaboration with various people. So based on uh, a few recent papers, starting from this paper in 2018 with uh, Cooper, Rosalie Swingle, uh, Chris Waddell, and David Wakeham, and then some more recent work, uh, these papers from the last couple of years and work in progress with Brian Swingle and Peter Simigida and uh, Stefano Antonini. Okay, and so the basic idea is the motivation for the work is to ask the question, if we can come up with microscopic quantum gravities uh, models of cosmology. So this is, I think, one of the main reasons why maybe we're interested in understanding quantum gravity to understand uh, some complete description of cosmology, which would include an understanding of the Big Bang. So there are various puzzles in cosmology that I think perhaps um, a full microscopic understanding could help address. And so that would be, include the Big Bang, dark energy, understanding dark matter, perhaps um, understanding inflation or whether there was inflation or uh, if, we, if we can understand more about the initial conditions in the universe. And so currently a lot of the quantum gravity research is using what I think is the best and most successful approach so far, which is the ADS-CFT correspondence. This came out of string theory. And so what I want to describe in this talk is how a lot of the work in using the ADS-CFT correspondence doesn't directly address cosmological physics, because it seems that maybe the kinds of space times that we can describe using this approach to quantum gravity don't include ordinary cosmological space times like the one we observe, but I want to discuss uh, the possibility that maybe we can still use this approach in an interesting way to actually describe cosmology. So first I'm gonna start because I, I think maybe it's a fairly broad audience just with a quick review of the basic setup of ADS-CFT, and then I'll move on to describing how I think we might be able to use it to discuss cosmological physics. Okay. So ADS-CFT is a bizarre statement that if you want to understand quantum gravity, or at least certain examples of, of quantum gravity theories, then you should study some completely unrelated system, or some, some well, a compl uh, very different kind of physical system, which is not at all gravitational. And so specifically, if you want to understand uh, three plus one dimensional quantum gravity, then the ADS-CFT correspondence says you should study a quantum field theory in two plus one dimensions. And a way to visualize that is that this quantum field theory in two plus one dimensions might be the field theory that describes some kind of uh, an, an exotic material. So you should just imagine a, a shell, like a, a two-dimensional sphere made of some exotic material, and it would have some ordinary kind of quantum field theory Hamiltonian that describes the physics. And there's no gravity there at all. There's no fluctuations in the shape of the sphere. It's just 
regular fields and uh, the geometry is say spherical. And so you might wonder how could that possibly describe gravitational physics in some higher dimension? And the idea is that even though this is some ordinary quantum system in two plus one dimensions, and it has an ordinary Hamiltonian and there's no gravity there apparently, the idea is that there's some kind of uh, a way that the gravitational physics is encoded in this quantum state. So somehow the physics of a higher dimensional space-time is encoded in the quantum physics of this lower dimensional space-time. And so we've been trying to understand over the past decades, how does this work? Um, and how do you go from the quantum state of the simple system to the gravitational physics in the space-time picture. And so we've understood quite a few things by now, uh, but just to go through some of the very basic uh, elements in this correspondence. So the first thing we could say is that the energy of the state in the quantum mechanics picture is related in some way to an energy that you can define in gravitational space-times. And so, the understanding is that the lowest energy possible state of your quantum system corresponds to just describing an empty space on the gravity side. And here it is a little bit specific. So the kind of space time that is described by the vacuum state of one of these holographic, um, holographic um, quantum field theories is a state, uh, a space time that is negatively curved everywhere. And it is the kind of space time that we call anti de Sitter space time. So it's just a, a homogeneous and isotropic negatively curved space. Uh, it has interesting properties. So, in one of the interesting properties is that if you were to send a light signal from the middle of the space, it would actually reach some kind of a boundary in finite time, or, or it would it would sorry go out and it would could come back to the same point in a finite amount of time. Um, so sometimes people talk about the anti de Sitter space time as having a boundary. It has a particular boundary geometry, and the the boundary geometry you can think of as being the same geometry as this as this field theory lives on. Okay, um, so that would be one particular state of the field theory, the vacuum state, it would be dual to empty space. And then I could consider other states of the quantum field theory. So if I suppose, uh, suppose I add some energy to this state. So now consider the vacuum state plus some small perturbation. And so now there's a little bit of energy that might be moving around in my quantum field theory. And so that corresponds to some small perturbation of the gravitational space-time. So you might have some gravitational waves moving through an otherwise empty ADS space-time. And then you can consider more complicated states. So for example, if you were to take this quantum field theory and put it in contact with some heat bath, so heat up the quantum field theory to some high temperature, then, so that corresponds to adding a lot of energy on the quantum field theory side. And in the gravity picture, it corresponds to also adding uh, some large amount of energy. And in this case, it's understood that that would correspond to, uh, that would end up kind of collapsing into a black hole. So there's a correspondence between black hole states in the gravity picture and some thermal states in the field theory picture, or, or generally high energy states in the field theory would correspond to having, a, say, a large black hole in the middle of the space time. And the space time is still asymptotically kind of empty and asymptotically negatively curved. So out near the boundary, it kind of looks the same as it did in the vacuum state. Okay. So we can have all sorts of more interesting states, we could imagine states that have multiple black holes, they could be orbiting each other, producing gravitational waves. So there's all sorts of interesting physics that we could try to 
describe using this ADS CFT correspondence. And the idea would be that even an interesting state like the one on the right hand side here would correspond just to some particular more or less ordinary state of the, of the quantum field theory where you'd have energy, it wouldn't be uniformly distributed around the, um, the shell. In, instead, it would be localized, it would be dynamic and time dependent. And the idea would be there, there'd be hopefully some way that you could look at this quantum field theory state and extract the information about the dual space time. And so this is a very interesting question in the ads cft correspondence. How do you extract the information about the dual space-time from the quantum state? And there's been a lot of recent progress in this. And so uh, a, lot of, a lot of this um, work in the past 10 or 15 years has led us to this understanding that to go from the left side to the right hand side here, thinking about quantum information theory is, is crucial. Okay. And so, so um, Tadashi is one of the pioneers there in understanding that, for example, measures of entanglement between two different parts of this quantum system on the left would correspond directly to some geometrical quantities on the right hand side. And so this has been, we've, we've understood many things uh, and we've started to apply these to make, to improve our understanding of the gravitational physics. So for example, in the last couple of years, people have understood significant things about black holes and black hole evaporation and the famous black hole information paradox and our understanding that, uh, you know, the way of thinking about these things using quantum information theory has helped immensely in understanding these things. So there's been a lot of progress, but what I wanna to do today is not talk specifically about those directions. Uh, I want to ask about the original question, which is whether we could use any of this to actually understand cosmological physics. And by the way, I'm happy to take any questions during the talk. So feel free to raise your hands or even uh, put a question in the chat. Okay, so what is what is the problem? Why why is it why has it been so difficult to describe cosmology? We have a, what is apparently a perfectly good model of quantum gravity. We've had great success in understanding the physics of black holes and other gravitational phenomena. So why can't we just apply it somehow to, uh, to come up with a model of our universe? Okay. And so I should warn you that what I'm going to describe, I'm going to give you um, just some ideas for how we might actually do that. But I want, I'm going to warn you that what I'm describing is not a complete story. And so you shouldn't uh, expect a full answer by the end of the talk, but I think the ideas are interesting and perhaps helpful in going in this direction. Okay. Um, and I should say that many people have, have certainly discussed ideas for using ADS CFT to describe cosmology. And I won't have time to mention all of the different approaches, um, but I would say that uh, maybe none of them for me are completely satisfactory. And so this is one of the motivations for me that I wanted to uh, think about this problem. Okay. Um, so one major issue based on what I've described so far is that these various states of the quantum field theory, this two plus one dimensional quantum field theory that I was talking about in the ADS CFT correspondence, they all have the property that even though there may be interesting things in the middle of the space time, so we could have black holes and gravitational waves and lots of interesting matter, and this could all be interacting and so forth. Um, generally speaking, all of those configurations have some matter confi confined in a region of an otherwise empty space time. Okay, so, so we're describing a space time which is you know, I mentioned it only takes a finite amount of time for light to go to the boundary and back, but it's still actually an infinite volume space time. So it's an infinite volume space time and you have matter more or less just in some, uh, in some region. And you can consider more and more higher and higher energy states so that the matter um, spreads out more and more. Um, but basically all of the states that we consider 
um, are still empty asymptotically. So there's not an obvious way to say, take a, a limit so that uh, you would just fill your universe with stuff. Okay, whereas in cosmology, this is exactly what we want to describe. In cosmology, the basic assumption is that you have a, a homogeneous and isotropic universe, which is the same everywhere and there's matter density everywhere. And so it seems to be in conflict with this basic picture of what we can describe using ADS-CFT. Okay, so um, one idea for that, that people have discussed in the past, and I'll, I'll be making use of this, um, is that we could describe four-dimensional cosmology in a slightly different way using the ADS-CFT correspondence. So the basic picture is that perhaps we could imagine an asymptotically ADS spacetime, which is also empty near the boundary, which is in green here. But perhaps somewhere in the middle of the spacetime, you have what we would call a brain, so some lower dimensional surface. And you might have some matter localized onto that brain. And that brain, the matter on that brain could have some dynamics. And the geometry of the brain could also have some dynamics. And perhaps it could look like cosmology. And it would all there, it, it would all be there in the interior of the space-time. And then there could be some um, some other space between that brain and the asymptotic boundary. And by the time you get out to this boundary, maybe, maybe everything looks uh, again empty and negatively curved. Okay, so the idea was would be that maybe there's a, a whole say five-dimensional space-time, which is asymptotically ADS and um, asymptotically it looks empty and negatively curved, but somewhere in the interior, there is a four-dimensional space-time which has all the matter and everything um, that would correspond to the cosmological physics. Okay. And so for that to be a viable approach to cosmology, then somehow you would need the gravity on the brain. So if, if you were uh, somewhere on this brain observing the physics, you would need the gravity to seem four dimensional, even though the space is higher dimensional. So using this approach requires the idea of gravity localization. And this is something that was discussed by, this is an idea that was discussed um, in particular by Randall and Sundrum many years ago. So there's, there's an idea that in some cases we can actually get this to work and we can localize gravity onto a lower dimensional surface in the context of a higher dimensional space time. Okay. So I wanna explain how we could achieve this in ADS-CFT. Okay. So how can we localize, how do we come up with um, ADS-CFT models where gravity is localized to a brain? Okay, so um, because we, we eventually want to describe four dimensional gravity localized to a brain. I want to start actually by thinking about a three-dimensional um, a three-dimensional quantum field theory. So here, right, what I'm using the CFT, I, th I think I didn't actually mention that, but you know, the ADS CFT, I'm sure you've heard the CFT part is just that it's often considered to be a conformal field theory. There are examples of holography where the quantum field theory is not conformal, but I'll be using conformal field theories. Um, SCFT indicates that it's a supersymmetric conformal field theory. Many of the real microscopic examples of ADS-CFT that we have and that we understand start from a supersymmetric theory. Um, later, I'll be breaking supersymmetry, but my starting point here is gonna be a three-dimensional holographic uh, superconformal field theory that would be dual to some specific four-dimensional theory of gravity. Now, I sh should also mention maybe that in string theory, these gravity duals typically act typically have some extra dimensions as well. Um, so in the fully microscopic examples of this duality, you would have some 3D theory, and then there would be, say, four large dimensions and maybe some microscopic ones as well. But for most of this talk, I'll basically be ignoring the compact microscopic internal directions. Okay, so, so here's the starting point. 
three-dimensional quantum field theory. And then the gravity side is a four-dimensional theory. And so you see this one is um, asymptotically ADS. And so instead, I'm just um, simplifying the drawing. Instead of drawing like a sphere as I was before, I'm imagining just uh, that, that I'm flattening that out. Um, so we can also have examples of the ADS CFT correspondence where, where uh, the field theory is just on Minkowski space instead of on a sphere. And then the boundary geometry for the gravity theory would be flat instead of spherical. Okay, so that will be more convenient for me. Um, but I can go back and make everything spherical. This is going to, eventually this is gonna be the difference between a spherical closed cosmology and a flat cosmology. So for most of the talk, I'm going to be giving you the details where that would correspond to a flat cosmology. Okay, so, so starting from that, we can modify the theory in a certain way. So I want to consider that original holographic theory that was dual to a four-dimensional theory of gravity. And now actually what I want to do is couple the field theory, couple those degrees of freedom to extra degrees of freedom. So these extra degrees of freedom take the form of a higher dimensional field theory. Okay, so we have the 3D theory, and now this is coupled to a higher dimensional field theory at the boundary of this, of this higher dimensional field theory. And we could ask, well, what is this combination of things dual to? Dual to? So uh, we previously had a four-dimensional gravity theory. And then now we might imagine that the 4D CFT is dual to a, a five-dimensional gravity theory. And so somehow these things being coupled together mean that our four-dimensional gravity theory should be somehow coupled to a five-dimensional gravity theory. And geometrically, that can happen if we have some five-dimensional space-time and then uh, a certain brain inside this five-dimensional space-time that provides a, a kind of an interior boundary, and then these two are just geometrically coupled together. Okay, so this, this kind of picture of, of um, CFTs with boundaries and understanding their holographic duels, um, Karch and Randall discussed this, also uh, Tadashi, uh, had some uh, important work on the subject. Okay, so I want to consider a very specific case um, of, of this. So what I wanted to do now is argue that if there are many more degrees of freedom in the 3D theory than in the 4D theory, so, so say many more fields in the 3D theory than in the 4D theory, um, then in that case, I want to argue that the gravity will be localized on this end of the world brain. And the argument is basically just that, uh, or a simple version of the argument is just that um, if we have some huge number of degrees of freedom in this holographic uh, 3D theory, and then there's a 4D gravitational dual picture to that, and now we just add a few fields um, and couple them in. So in some sense, that should be a relatively small perturbation. If you imagine some physical process in the 3D field theory, uh, some could be time dependent process. And now you consider the same initial state, but we have this 4D theory coupled in now, but with relatively few degrees of freedom. Um, so that, of course that will have an effect, but um, it should be smaller and smaller if this ratio of C, the number of degrees of freedom of the 4D theory to the number of degrees of freedom to the 3D theory, if that becomes smaller and smaller, then it should have less and less of an effect. Okay, so, so the argument is that if the number of 40 degrees of freedom is way smaller than the number of 3D degrees of freedom, um, then you're certainly introducing some new physics. On the gravity side, we might visualize that as being a five-dimensional part of our geometry, but the physics of this four-dimensional part of the geometry, uh, the physics of what I'm calling the end of the world brain, should be actually very similar to what it was before. And that is, it should be very similar to a, a four-dimensional theory of gravity. Okay, so, so maybe it's a 4D theory of gravity, but, but very slowly some information could leak into the bulk or that you could, you could, um, you, you could perhaps have some process, some scattering process on the 4D brain that uh, causes energy to leave that and enter the five-dimensional part of the geometry. May I ask a question? Yes, please. 
Um, so C of the 40, do you take the C of the 40 to be very large or not necessary? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, it's sometimes useful to think of the C of the 4D to be large if you would like to visualize the dual as being fully geometrical. Mm -hmm. But I think later it won't be important for the physics that C of the 4D theory is large. So I think it's actually interesting to consider the case where C of the 4D theory might be some modest uh, number, some, some order one number seven or 10 or something. Um, mm -hmm. And what's really important is that the C of the 3D theory is very large. So I think it so will be interesting C later to consider um, this hierarchy where C40 could be small, C3D is very large, and that's important for having a geometrical four-dimensional uh, space-time. Mm -hmm. But the 5D part doesn't could be strongly curved or not very geometrical. I see. So C of the 3D is very large, so there's a 4D dual, but the C of the 4D is not necessarily large. So that's not right. necessarily that's five D picture. That, that's a crucial. That's for, right. for the exactly. confinement. Okay, yes, exactly. Okay. Oh, this slide got cut off. Okay. Oh, there it is. Right. Okay. So I will. I will just mention that um, there are some well understood microscopic examples of of this picture. So um, one microscopic example of a 40 CFT that people in strong theory study a lot is called N equals four super Yang Mills theory. And it's well known what the gravitational dual of that is. And for that theory, there are many well-known examples of uh, three-dimensional supersymmetric theories that you can couple to this. And uh, it's also known exactly what um, those uh, theories are dual to. So one could actually understand exactly what uh, what, what are these geometries on, on the right-hand side. and um, as I mentioned, the full geometries are really 10 dimensional geometries. And so this end of the world brain is, you should think of it as some part of a bigger um, 10 dimensional geometry. And there actually what happens is the, the compact directions, the internal um, dimensions are actually large compared to in the 5D region. So, um, so that will be not, too important for the rest of the talk, but it's just good to know that we can kind of verify these statements and understand them in some specific examples. Okay, so um, so far what we have is this way to construct some asymptotically ADS five-dimensional space with a four-dimensional end of the world brain. And this geometry, well, it's just um, static if I, if I considered the vacuum state of that boundary field theory um, what we wanted is this picture where you have some brain, which is strictly in the interior of the geometry, and we have some time-dependent cosmological evolution on this brain. Um, so we don't quite have what we want. In the left picture, the brain actually goes all the way out to the boundary. <clears throat> and so, again, you would just be describing, um, even in the four-dimensional picture, it's still just an asymptotically ADS space-time. Okay. So... We need to do a little bit more to get towards the picture on the right. And the next step is a little bit, uh, it won't be obvious why I'm doing the next step until uh, a few slides from now, but let's, let's just do something and then we'll try to understand what is the gravity version of doing that thing. And then we'll see why it's related to cosmology. Okay, so the, so the next thing I wanna do is to actually introduce a second boundary into this setup. So I want to introduce a second, second uh, three-dimensional conformal field theory that lives at a second boundary over here. And uh, this one is going to be the mirror image of, of, of this uh, conformal field theory. So the full, the full quantum field theory here um, has a symmetry, which is a reflection in the vertical direction. And actually, typically, that will, that will break supersymmetry. So naively, you might think that because now I have two copies of this 3D theory and uh, each of those corresponded to some four-dimensional gravitational physics, which we understood to be the, an end of the world brain, you might think that this thing on the left would be dual to something like this on the right with two end of the world brains coming off and some 5D space time in, in between. Um, it turns out that this configuration, however, 
specifically in this situation where we break supersymmetry, this might be unstable. That is actually not the preferred gravitational configuration with these boundary conditions. So instead, what I think happens in many cases is that those two end of the world brains coming from the two or associated with these two different uh, three dimensional theories, um, they actually join up in the middle of the geometry. So like this picture in the right. So instead of being separate, uh, they will eventually come together and join up. And there are a couple of arguments for that. Okay, so uh, one of the basic arguments comes from examples in string theory. Maybe I'll just say, uh, give a qualitative argument that uh, because we've introduced a 3D theory and then over here, it, there's, there's some mirror image theory. Um, so if, if you think about the brain, this four-dimensional brain going into the geometry, then kind of, so just like particles have antiparticles, um, in string theory and in, in these gravitational uh, quantum gravity theories, often brains, uh, so higher dimensional objects, will have anti-versions of the same thing. So when you have this reflection symmetry, and this is the mirror image version of this one, um, then you can think of the bottom end of the world brain as being like the antiparticle of the top end of the world brain. And so there's a tendency that those would like to annihilate each other. They're prevented from doing so because they're attached to this asymptotically ADS boundary. So they, can, they, can, uh, they have to start here, but then as they go into the bulk, um, I think there's a tendency that they will want to, um, instead of going forever, um, they, they'll want to actually join up and sort of in that way kind of annihilate um, as much as possible. Um, so that's a kind of a string theory argument for why this right-hand picture is correct. But there's also a quantum field theory argument. And so the difference in quantum field theory between this picture and this picture um, is significant. And, and so it represents a significant difference in the infrared physics of this quantum field theory. So here's a field theory that it's really four dimensional, but you see that the vertical direction in the picture is finite. And so if we can ask about the physics at length scales that are much larger than that distance, the vertical direction in this picture. Okay. So at, at these very long length scales, then we have a theory that is going to behave like some three-dimensional quantum field theory. And in holography, there's an understanding that the infrared physics, okay, so the behavior of the field theory at these, at these long distance scales corresponds to the behavior of the geometry as you go farther and farther away from the boundary. Okay, so the difference between these two possibilities is a difference in the geometry in the direction where you go uh, a long distance from the boundary. In this case, if we started at some point in the middle of the space time, well, you could just keep going. It just keeps going forever. You can, you, there's, no, um, there's no boundary as we go to the right here. Um, whereas in this case, the, you eventually hit uh, a boundary, the end of the world brain, you will hit that at some finite distance. And so that translates in field theory language that says that in one case, we would have um, non-trivial physics at all scales. Whereas in the other case, we would have non-trivial physics down to some um, length scale. And then there would be essentially, um, it would be like a, a gapped theory that, or, or a confined theory. There would be essentially um, nothing, nothing, no interesting physics below uh, that certain length scale. And, and so we can ask, well, what is our expectation then um, for this kind of a setup where, where we have this 3D theory and then another 3D conformal field theory, and then we couple those together with a 4D theory. Um, so, well, maybe in some special cases, this thing could flow down to um, a new conformal field theory in the infrared, uh, especially if we preserved supersymmetry, that would be true. If, if I, if I chose to preserve supersymmetry with both of the boundaries, 
um, then it would often be true that this flows down to a new 3D conformal field theory in the infrared. But if I break supersymmetry, um, then we might expect that, say more generically, then uh, the infrared physics is not some new interesting conformal field theory, but rather it just ends up being uh, a gap theory. Okay. And so, uh, so that's another kind of more generic um, argument for for why we might expect this kind of a picture on the right hand side. So Mark, I have a question. Yes. Are you, so in, in this kind of confined like this uh, annihilation case is, are you assuming some sim similar type of boundary condition or? So you, you have a two boundary. Yes. And this two boundary maybe should so, be in the similar class so that they are yeah, so, yeah. So they, they should be exactly the um, kind of mirror image. So um, in maybe I'll just mention for this people that are familiar with string theory, uh, th this kind of um, quantum field theory could arise if you have uh, D3 brains ending on some stacks of five brains and and uh, NS5 D5s and NS5 brains. So so if you have three brains ending on five brains, then you can get this theory with a boundary. And, and then in order to get um, the other theory here, what I should do is take exactly the anti-brains of, uh -huh. of the uh, ones that gave you the first boundary. So I'm introducing a new boundary theory, which is ju just exactly the ones from the, ant pr the precise anti-brain configuration. And so I think um, in that case, then it's possible for these to join up um, perfectly. So um, it's well understood in a probe brain example where you, you could have the n equals four theory and then you could have a defect um, uh, related to a five brain and another defect related to an anti five brain. And then in the gravity dual, you would have a probe five brain and a probe anti five brain and then those would join up. I see. So it's important, yeah. So it's important to have just well, like the mirror. Maybe generically there are some non-canceled charge, then there are still some slot that remains maybe. Yeah, that's right. I think if you didn't cancel the charge uh, perfectly, then it would it would necessarily have to uh, have, say, I don't know, part of the 4D theory would continue into the infrared. So then then maybe it would be- Thank you very much. Um, conformal. Yeah. Oh, sorry, can I ask another question? Yes. So in this setup, I, I, I somehow assume that you are taking not so much high temperature in the boundary. Because otherwise, if you put the too much temperature, the, the, the 4D, this localized universe is eaten up by the big black hole. That's what you yeah, want to. Yeah, absolutely. So Maybe you may, um, in this picture right here, I actually am considering just the vacuum physics. So this right. is important. Right. Uh, later, we'll talk about um, in the cosmology picture, there will, there will be uh, energy and finite temperature and everything. But so far, what I'm saying is that the vacuum state of this theory is is dual to this um, this geometry on the right, and that, that's right, the right. that's Good. the assertion. That's understand. But in cosmology, the most interesting situation is that when the universe is very high temperature situation, am I right? Like big yes. bang, where you have very high. But then in, in this setup, then my worry is that this 4D localized universe is eaten by the big black hole in the Okay, so we, so we need to under we need to understand the relation um, uh, uh -huh. between this picture and uh -huh. the cosmology picture. And that's what uh -huh. I'm gonna turn to next. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um so okay, so we have a an interesting geometry here, um, but it's it's not cosmology. Uh, so we have an end, end of the world brain and now it intersects the boundary at two places. But remember, we didn't really want to intersect the boundary at all. Um, so what does this have to do with the cosmology that we're trying to construct? Okay, so the thing to notice here is that if you look at the geometry of this end of the world brain, um, so now it has these two asymptotically ADS regions. And so if you write down the metric for that, then it would look like, uh, you could write the metric in this form. It would have a non-trivial dependence on this direction that goes from one ADS boundary to the other ADS boundary. Um, and so this scale factor here would go to infinity at both of those boundaries. Okay. And so you see that this geometry, it's just a static geometry. So in, in the, 
like the time direction here I'm calling Z. Uh, so it's, it's um, like a vacuum static geometry. But what we notice is that if we were to do some analytic continuation here, then we could actually get to a cosmology, uh, cosmological space time. Okay, so, so, so far we have this vacuum theory, this vacuum state. We said it's dual to a picture like this. This is a static geometry. Um, but if we could understand um, how to do an analytic continuation, so if I took uh, that Z to IZ and then this T, this tau to IT, the analytic continuation of the space time looks like this. So you could actually do it more, um, to, the analytic continuation for the whole space time. In the analytic continued space time, then actually this end of the world brain, it doesn't ever reach the boundary. Um, in this picture, it's dynamical. So the, the scale factor now depends on the physical time. And in particular, the, geomet the 4D geometry of the end of the world brain um, is an FRW kind of uh, cosmology. And we'll see actually it's a big, generally a big bang, big crunch cosmology. Okay. But, um, but we need to understand what, what does this correspond to in field theory language? Okay. So, that, so that's the, the remaining step. So we've understood just that mathematically we could take this and analytically continue it and get co a cosmological picture. Uh, but we need to understand what does that analytic continuation mean in the ADSC, in the CFT language? Okay. Um, I should mention that this idea that you could get cosmology by analytically continuing um, a geometry like this with two asymptotically ADS boundaries is originally due to Maldacena and Maus. So they, they had um, the idea that maybe you could do this, um, but not, their, their original approach was not in the context of some end of the world brain. And in the end, they weren't quite sure how to realize it in the context of ADS CFT. So what we're doing here is gonna be something like the Maldacena Mao's idea, but now the 4D theory is some end of the world brain in this higher dimensional setup. Excuse me, Mark. Yes, uh, please. Where, where did the ADS boundaries go in the, after the double analytic continuation? Um, so let's, yeah, let's um, postpone that for a couple of slides and I think it'll be more clear. Okay, thank so, you. Okay, yeah. Okay, so this is our question. Um, what is this dual to? And then we'll, we'll also try to understand this, um, this question. Um, okay, so let me start describing this with the following picture. So we have a quantum field theory that I've introduced, which has 3D parts and 4D parts. And it was a regular Lorentzian quantum field theory, and we were considering the vacuum state. Now, I could also consider a theory that I get by one analytic continuation. Um, so if, if I take the time direction, which was, um, sorry, Z, Z here. So nothing interesting depended on Z. It was our time direction here. I could imagine analytically continuing that to define some Euclidean theory. Okay. So the theory that we started with has a natural Euclidean theory, which is related to it. And this has two three-dimensional Euclidean quantum field theories coupled by a Euclidean four-dimensional theory. And there's some path integral for that theory that I could write down. And this would compute just the usual partition function of the model. Okay, so starting from that Euclidean theory, what I'm going to do is, imagining, uh, is imagine slicing the path integral in two different ways. So we'll slice the path integral in two different ways. And this will define two different states of Lorentzian quantum field theories. So let me remind you how that works. Okay, so I have, I have this Euclidean theory and I'm going to imagine just slicing it there or there. And so what I mean by defining a state by slicing the path integral. Okay, okay so this path integral is, is a, or that picture is associated with this path integral, which is just an integral over all the field configurations of the 3D fields and the 4D fields weighted by e to the minus Euclidean action. So 
now what I mean by a slicing, so now I consider this slice. And so what I can do is define a state by giving the wave function for this state. And so this is going to be a state of the degrees of freedom that live on this slice. So 3D fields and 4D fields, and these are all coupled together. And the state is going to be given by this wave function. If, the, if I take the wave function evaluated on this field configuration, then it's equal to the integral over all possible field configurations on the lower half of this picture with the boundary condition that the fields are equal to phi a at the, at the slice. Okay. So this is a particular function of the fields of the possible fields on the slice. And so that defines a state. So this wave function defines a state of this theory with two 3D theories coupled to a 4D theory. And in fact, it's the vacuum state. Okay, so, so the reason we can see it's the vacuum state is that there's like a, a semi-infinite amount of Euclidean time going up to this slice A. So below that, there's just, it's just translation symmetric. And this is actually the standard way to construct the vacuum state of a field theory using a Euclidean path integral. Okay, so, so that's the A slice. But I could take the same Euclidean path integral and slice it on the B slice. And so this, notice that the B slice does not intersect the 3D theories at all. So if I use the same path integral to define a state on the B slice, then the wave functional that I'm uh, defining in the similar way is actually just a state of the 4D CFT. It's, this, it's, this, it's a state of that 4D CFT um, on Minkowski space. And it's not a vacuum state. It's not the vacuum state. It is some specific excited state. Okay. So it's, it's the state with this wave function where the wave functional evaluated on a field configuration 5B is just this integral. Um, and the integral involves both 4D fields and 3D fields. But the interesting thing is that the 3D fields, they're not even physical degrees of freedom. They're just there in the path integral as kind of a mathematical tool to generate an interesting state for us. Okay, so, so we have these two states associated with the same Euclidean path integral. And now my claim is that these two states, so this kind of, um, the relation between these two geometries that I had before is precisely that one of them is dual to the first state and the other is dual to the second state. Okay, so we see that this is some kind of double analytic continuation. Um, and so the vacuum state of the 3D, 4D, 3D theory is the thing we were considering before. We understood that was dual to this geometry here. And then on the right-hand side, we have the analytically continued geometry. And now I'm telling you that that is dual to this kind of different way of slicing the path integral. So it's, it's dual to this other state. Okay, and, and in particular, we noticed that there is no in the degrees of freedom on the slice, on the B slice, we don't have any boundaries. We don't have any 3D fields. And so that's, I guess, a way to understand the answer to um, the question about why does the brain in this picture not go to the boundary? Um, it's because you don't have any 3D degrees of freedom in, in the boundary in this, in this picture. It's, it's a state of just the 4D CFT. Okay, so that, that is um, the, the final, the claim is that if I consider this particular state of a 40 conformal field theory, which is constructed using a Euclidean uh, 3D conformal field theories, so all of these degrees of freedom are just there in the Euclidean path integral, um, then that will be a state that is dual to a geometry that has this end of the world brain somewhere in the interior. Now, an interesting point about this is that this, so this is like a complicated like, high can energy. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in the right picture, uh, you just mentioned, uh, yeah, yeah, this one. Uh, the imaginary time evolution is a finite extent. Yes. So how does it, uh, real, how, uh, how can we know uh, the imaginary time evolution is finite in the Lorentzian picture? 
Um, so the so the time evolution is finite in this Euclidean picture in our construction of the state. Um, in the Lorentzian picture, then, right. So um, I get you're asking, how, you know, how do why do we have a, a say an infinite amount of time in the Lorentzian picture? Or, mm. or is that is that the the question? Uh, or in, in other words, uh, how uh, from the Lorentzian picture? If we yes. only have a Lorentzian picture, uh, how can we know that? Uh, is there any difference that? Uh, yeah. the we only have three D brain and no anti brain, but or uh, the case we have anti brain. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess um, let me say a couple of things just about this state. So the the state is that we we have this path integral with the three D brain or the three D um, conformal field theory. Mm -hmm at a finite amount of time in the Euclidean past. So one thing we could say is what happens if I, if I push that further and further back? I, I mean, if, if I had some like more and more Euclidean time evolution, uh, that, would, that would just re keep reducing the energy and eventually I would end up with the vacuum state. So, so maybe something to say is that this particular state, because it only has that finite amount of evolution, it's going to be a high energy state from the point of view of the um, like the 40 CFT. And actually just, this is the next point I was gonna make when you have some high energy state of, of a 40 CFT an ADS CFT, I mean, remember that was supposed to be dual to some black hole. Um, this is what I said at the beginning of the talk. And so it turns out if you're careful, so if you take this geometry and you do the, the double analytic continuation, and you look at the full five-dimensional geometry, um, it actually is some kind of a black hole. So we have this high energy state and it's dual to a geometry that's asymptotically ADS. But actually, if you go into this uh, geometry, before you actually ever encounter this end of the world brain, you would encounter a black hole horizon. And so then if you went past the black hole horizon, then somewhere in behind the black hole horizon, is like an inner boundary to the space time. And that's where this end of the world brain lives. And so you, you would have this, um, this cosmological physics. So the, the brain would have this FRW kind of geometry, um, but that's entirely contained in the region behind the horizon of, of, a, of a black hole. Um, this picture is probably helpful for if, if you're familiar with these space-time diagrams of black holes, then the idea is that we've got time in the in the vertical direction here. <clears throat> and then this dotted line here represents the like outside there is the exterior of the black hole. This is the black hole horizon. And then this is the interior of the black hole. And so the full space-time picture um, of of this geometry might look like this, where this end of the world brain, so instead of going out to the boundary, it's actually originating in the black hole singularity, um, in the past singularity, and it's ending up in the future singularity of the black hole. And these points where it connects with the singularities would have the interpretation of being the big bang and the big crunch in the cosmology. Sorry, can I ask a question? I, I, I just somehow missed the point. Can you okay. go to the previous page, please? Yes. Yes, so so in the left figure, you have the 3D uh, theory, and that is dual to the, in the right figure, this end of the world brain in the bulk, yeah. am I right or not? Yeah, so uh, uh, in the left picture, uh, the left picture is, is supposed to be Euclidean's so yeah, that, that's I completely understand right so it's a initially right. 3d field theory and then time able by finite amount and you obtain the 4d state is that right that's right that's yeah so we have this like 4d state so it's like right. 40 field theory on on Minkowski space um, that's right. in some high energy state and then mm -hmm. the dual of that is is uh, like a, a kind of a planar black hole and behind the horizon of the black hole there's this end of the world brain so 
the but state why is a, horizon, okay the so state life is a, horizon why yeah, why is it why is there a horizon um yeah so it's it's basically um because so one way one way to understand it is simply taking this full oops i'm sorry okay so taking this full five-dimensional geometry uh -huh. and if you analytically if you do this double analytic continuation you can actually see that it's some black hole space time so you can see it in detail wow. but also just generically we expect if we have some high energy state mm -hmm. then we would expect that to be dual to some black hole. So most, mm -hmm. most high energy states in EDS CFT uh, would correspond to some kind of black hole. But then in this case, it's a inter very interesting kind of black hole because there's some, um, some sp very specific physics behind the horizon. And that's, that's the physics that we're going for. So this finiteness, which is associated to the excited states, is the origin of the black hole horizon, if I understand correctly. That's right. Am I yeah. right? Yeah, that, and then this so finiteness the, is because of the evolution in the Euclidean path integral is finite. That, that's yes. the main reason. Yeah, that's right. So we just have like a relatively small amount. Um, uh -huh. if, if we took this tau zero to zero, then the energy of our state would be going to infinity and that right. would correspond to right. a, um, a bigger and bigger black hole. So in the left figure, that this tau zero finiteness corresponds to the right figure, this tau zero in the finiteness, am I right? Yeah, so that, we have that's a, that's a brain, way horizon, to and then that, that, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, may, maybe one more. So, so, what is the origin of this big one and big current singularity, which also I miss? Is that because of the horizon coincide with uh, the end of the world brain in this geometry? Um, it's yeah, it's because um, in in the full space time geometry, when you have a black hole, then then there's some past and future singularity in the geometry right, right, and right, right, this, right. this end of the world brain actually stays behind the horizon of the black hole uh -huh. um and you know anything behind the horizon of a black hole is is, is going to end up in the singularity um so the brain right. uh is is just like something behind the horizon and it has no choice but to end up crunching in the future right. and in the past it uh it has uh, a big bang or it also has a singularity okay. yeah all right thank you Okay, so I, I think I met the, the summary uh, part. Um, okay, so, um, so I've motivated some construction and uh, you know, I should say that many things still, I think need to be checked, um, but uh, it would be exciting because if, if this construction works, it, it would give some like, like fully microscopic um, non-perturbative description of four dimensional cosmological physics. And maybe it's not realistic cosmological physics. That's Kind of an entirely separate question: Can we can we get something that's realistic? But um, so far, even describing any sort of reasonable model um, of cosmology in four dimensions uh, has been difficult. So, um, so I think one of the interesting questions then is: How would you extract the information about the cosmology? So, how would you extract the cosmological observables, the scale factor, the evolution of the energy density, cosmological correlators? And actually, one of the very interesting things about this model is that um, the way to extract them is to use this, the, the simplest way to extract them is to use this duality between the black hole picture, the cosmology picture, and this, um, and this kind of confining gauge theory picture on the left. And so the point is that all of the cosmological observables here should be related by some analytic continuation to observables in the space time on the left that was related to the vacuum state of a, of a confining gauge theory. And so to study the possibilities for cosmology, then all you need to do is study um, these, these confining gauge theory models where you have 3D theories coupled by 4D theories. And one of the interesting things then is that the, there's very little theoretical input. So in choosing the the model, um, we need to choose which 4D theory we're talking about and which 3D boundary theories we're talking about. And, and then beyond that, the geometry here should be perfectly um, determined. And then through analytic continuation, the cosmological physics should also be completely determined. So there's no way, there's, there's no need to ever choose uh, some initial state or something for the cosmology. Uh, the only choice you make is what is the, what is the uh, 3D theory? What is the 4D theory? And you even have some, um, some way to uh, 
adjust which kind of effective field theory you want for the 40 physics. So if you if you want to have uh, some some specific age group like SU3 times SU2 times U1, um, then remember it's it's basically the 40 uh, effective field theory is the thing that's dual to this 3D CFT. So I should choose some 3D theory with a specific global symmetry group and that will give me a 40 theory, a 40 gravity theory on the end of the world brain that has the same uh, gauge uh, symmetry group. So even, even for model building, it, it seems to have some nice features. And so, so this is uh, the final slide. Then you have this <clears throat> picture where somehow the, cos if, if you just think about the effective field theory in 40, you have this picture where there's some cosmology um, it's a big bang, big crunch cosmology, but then uh, there's there's some interesting uh, analytic continuation where the, you have actually an AD, asymptotically ADS region in some imaginary time direction. And so we're exploring this model now, trying to understand if there are some general lessons for cosmology, understanding if there um, are some detailed examples we could work out. And then you know later one could, if, if if it actually works, then later one could think about realistic cosmology, but it's probably premature to make uh, that kind of question. Okay, so so thanks everyone, and I'm happy to answer any more questions. Thank you very much for a very interesting and stimulating talk. Thank you very much. Time for questions. Can I can I ask? Oh, you want? Can, can I ask? Please, please. Yeah. Um, so but I, I'm a bit confused with this analytic continuation, which is quite often people use for say, for example, ADS safety to DS safety and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. What is a physical observable you expected to obtain after the analytic continuation to, to, to understand the physics of the, this, this universe holographically? Yeah. Um, so, okay. So maybe I'll just comment um, first because it's it's true. Many people have discussed a possible way of describing cosmology by starting with ADS CFT and doing some kind of analytic continuation mm -hmm. um, to, to, for example, get de Sitter space time. And um, so that kind of analytic, analytic continuation is much um, more difficult to understand because generally there, what needs to happen is that you are analytically continuing something like the rank of the gauge group. So there's some parameter in the geometry that you want to continue to get de Sitter space. And in the CFT, it turns out to be say the rank of the gauge group. And then it doesn't maybe necessarily make sense to think about a field theory with uh, right. gauge group U of you know, IN or something. Um, so here we're doing something much more standard, which is um, just always, we're always still working with asymptotically ADS space times. Um, and I'm just kind of analytically continuing one of the, um, one of the ordinary coordinates. Um, so, so one of, you know, like a time coordinate or a space coordinate. Um, and so when I'm saying the observables in the cosmology are related by analytic continuations, uh, what I mean is simply that um, here we have uh, a geometry which is dual to this quantum field theory. And so I could imagine using ADS CFT um, or, or some other method to compute the expectation value of the stress energy tensor. Um, or the correlation functions of the stress energy tensor on this brain. Okay. And then I would take those sort of vacuum um, correlation functions and then just analytically continue those as functions. I would analytically continue the coordinate dependence. And then the result of that should give me the behavior as a function of time of the stress energy tensor in the cosmology or the correlation functions of the stress energy tensor in the cosmology. Or an even simpler example is just that the scale factor in the cosmology is just the analytic continuation of the scale factor in this um, in this picture on the left. Okay. Thank you. Okay. May I ask you a question about the uh, black hole singularities on the right hand side? Sure. What 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 do that uh, correspond to in uh, on on the left hand side? The CFT picture. Oh yeah. Um, Do you have any any uh, idea for the resolution of the singularities? Yeah. So this is, I mean, seems seems to be a very difficult question um, in general in ADS CFT. So if if I want to use the CFT to learn about physics behind the horizon of the black hole, to learn about local physics and and diagnose the singularity 
then uh, this is more or less a, an open question. There, there's some interesting research. Um, so pe people have, in cases where you have two-sided black holes, mm -hmm. um, and so, so like this bottom picture, but you have two asymptotically ADS boundaries, uh, then people have studied certain two-sided correlation functions of an operator um, on one side and an operator in the other side. Yeah, and, yeah. and so <clears throat> mm -hmm. there's been some indication that you can see the black hole singularity in the analytic structure of these correlation functions. But in, in one-sided black holes like this, I think mm -hmm. nobody really knows how to see the black hole singularity. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and so even like from, from the 4D um, picture here, even understanding the physics of this brain seems extremely difficult. And mm -hmm. so that's why I, I, I think it's nice that you have this, this dual picture and you can, you can now make use of the, um, the analytically continued picture. So even though it's, it would be very difficult to figure out the physics of the cosmology from mm -hmm. this 4D dual of this picture, mm -hmm. um, we could just go on the left-hand side. And then it's a much easier example of ADS CFT where there aren't no horizons. And then you can, you can easily extract um, or more easily extract the physics and then do the analytic continuation. But so, this is essentially a future problem. Yeah, it, it's, it's a mm. big open direction in okay. um, ADS CFT to understand mm -hmm. um, like basically physics, the local physics behind the black hole horizons and uh, local physics or the physics of black hole singularities. There's mm -hmm. been some um, like particularly interesting recent work. There was some paper by uh, Hong Liu and uh, Samuel Luthoiser from yeah, MIT. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah uh, I know that, yes. Yeah. So yes. I, th I think that was the most interesting one uh, recently uh -huh. that I mm -hmm. saw. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, can I question? Can I have a question? Uh, I'm not a, no expert of the same story. So I, it may be a naive question. So uh, in your slide, you mentioned about a five dimensional bulk plot, maybe non-geometrical. So mm. what does it mean? So ah. uh, it does not have any gravity dual picture. Yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, yeah, what is uh, your definition? Uh, the five-dimensional bulk is non-geometrical. Okay, very good. So um, this is a, a good point to mention. So someone early on asked me, does the 4D theory have to be a large number of degrees of freedom? And so I said, no, not necessarily. And this is very interesting because you see our final picture, um, the state that is dual to, that is describing this entire geometry is just a state of this 4D theory. And so maybe um, maybe the 4D theory here is not a conventionally holographic theory. It could be a theory with uh, a relatively few number of fields. Now, in that case, um, we would say that, that uh, so that's a case where I, I would say this five dimensional part of the geometry maybe is not geometrical. And what I mean by that is that, um, if you were to, in general, start with a standard example of ADS CFT, where you have a 40 theory with large number of degrees of freedom and some 5D geometry, and now I reduce the number of, of fields. Um, and so, um, what can happen is that um, the basically the scale of okay, there's there's two things that can happen. One is that some quantum gravity effects could be more and more important. Okay. And then another thing is just that the curvature bec could become um, higher and higher. And so uh, our understanding, if, if you just have some um, field theory with relatively few degrees of freedom, um, that might correspond to something that um, wouldn't be well described by ordinary general relativity. Maybe quantum gravity effects are very important. So it's, it's just highly fluctuating um, quantum geometry um, and perhaps the curvatures are very large. And, um, and so you wouldn't give that a description in terms of ordinary geometry or general relativity. It would be something more complicated that maybe we maybe it's there's some string theory description, but we probably don't know exactly how to describe it. So that's what I mean, um, that either quantum effects are very important or curvatures could be very large and it doesn't uh, have a usual description in terms of general relativity. Okay, then so can you analyze the stability of such a 
non-geometrical part or non-geometrical bulk. So if we have low energy picture like a GO, then we may compute some classical equation motion. Then we can analyze that in a stability of the solution. Mm. But if we do not have any certain picture, so how can you perform an analysis of certain stability of the five-dimensional non-geometric part? So, well, yeah, I, I think the, so I would say that we, we can certainly still analyze the, so this four-dimensional physics on the end of the world brain, that should still be described by some ordinary gravitational theory, it should, should have a good classical description. And so one could then try to understand um, the effects of the other part as maybe some kind of perturbation on to that. Um, but it, yeah, it's a good, it, it's, um, right, it's, it's probably difficult to get a complete understanding of, of this, of this five dimensional part in that case. But I, th I think maybe one could understand it as a, a certain type of perturbation to the four dimensional physics um, on in, in this region that I'm indicating in red. And, and so uh, one, one maybe expects that it, it should be controllable somehow. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, Mark, I have a question. Yes. About this. So one, a very similar set of also appears in the case of boundary conformable theory. So identifying your Laurentian state as a, a Cardi state, for example. Mm. What do you think of the difference between D, DCFT and your kind of, this is a new, uh, you introduce new degree of freedom as a boundary, namely 3D. So this difference is important in when we want to have this kind of cosmological interpretation yeah i, I mean i it's just a right I, I think actually states like um this this state that i have on the slide on the left here uh certainly people have considered this before in um in the bcft context so it's just a choice of whether what your time direction is. So I think uh, Cardi in particular considered this, uh, this he called a Euclidean quench um, where, you, where you start with a boundary and, state yeah. and, then, uh, and then you have some amount of Euclidean time evolution. And, uh, and then this was just a way to set up a certain interesting time dependent um, state in, in the CFT. So um, I, I think it's, it's interesting just I th in the ADS CFT context, you know, it seems that putting things into the Euclidean past uh, is a way of adding, I mean, as, as, as you've seen in, in many of your work, some putting, putting some things in the Euclidean past is a way of adding them somewhere in the interior of the geometry. Um, and yeah, so, B, B, yeah, so from BC, if we assume this is kind of BCFT and uh, maybe think of some cardio state, but uh, it's not so obvious that uh, to extract information, which is related to some localized degree of freedom yeah. on, on the gravity. But may, maybe if we have some this extra degree of freedom as you introduce as a 3D CF, SFT, as yeah. a 3D SCFT, maybe that is related to this degree of freedom, which realize localized on the end of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a bit, the, the biggest difference here from previous discussions is just that we have so many more degrees like yeah, the 3D yeah, CFT yeah. has to have many degrees of freedom uh, compared to the 4D. So it's, it's, I mean, not, not so much a boundary condition. It's almost like you, instead of adding a boundary to the 4D theory, you're adding a 4D theory to the 3D theory, um, which, which already has many degrees of freedom. I see. And on the other hand, you are, you, Laurentia picture, this uh, 3D part disappear because it is a hidden. Yeah, yeah. Of... It's just like, it's just like a, a way I think to, generate a very complicated state of the 4D. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe in terms of complexity, maybe it's a very high complexity see, see, state see, see, see. of the 4D theory but, uh, so that has a lot space, of information. I see, I see. Hilbert space is the same as this original 4D CFD. Yeah, yeah. I see, I see. But it's very, very highly 
But I think, you know, I think because you, you know, the reason why we can do something interesting, even maybe with a a relatively small central charge is that you just go to very high energies and then Uh you liberate a lot of degrees of freedom and you put those liberated degrees of freedom in a very complex uh, state. And then that can correspond to some, some black hole, but with, with you say a large volume um, uh, inside and then interesting end of the world brain physics inside. I see, I see. Yeah, that, that's very interesting, this highly excited state. Indeed. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, hi, uh, I want to ask, ask some questions. Yes. Yeah, maybe you have already mentioned in, in your talk, so um, I have some quick questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, what is the uh, intrinsic curvature of this end of the water brain after the energy continuation? Is that negative or positive? Yeah, that's a good question. So in the cosmology, um, at the turning point here, so in order to, so, so these, as I mentioned, these, these kinds of cosmologies that you get in this picture are, are big bang, big crunch cosmology. So they have a turning point. Um, and at the turning point, then the curvature is going to be negative. Um, but depending on the details of the model, I think earlier on, it's possible to have, um, um, well, okay, in terms of say the cosmological constant, it's possible to have some accelerating phase or, or it could just be um, decelerating the whole time. So I, th- I think um, the, the details can depend on exactly which model you choose. But at the turning point here, then you would, you would see a negative cosmological constant. I see. So at least at the turning point, you have some negative cosmological constants, but um, how to say, uh, but you can uh, make it positive or negative by changing the model, changing the details of the model. I, th- yeah. I think so. Yeah, we're looking at that. But it, I mean, if, if you wanted to, if you wanted this to describe some kind of realistic version of cosmology, then you would have to imagine that sometime in the future, our universe is turning around. Um, and, and then, but now, up until now, it's, we see it's accelerating. So, so maybe that can be accommodated by finding the right kind of situation, the, the right underlying theory, then maybe uh, in the cosmology picture, you would have po- like a positive acceleration and then it s- slows down and, and turns around. Um, so I think it's possible, but it depends on the details. I see, thanks. Uh, and my second question is that, uh, can you actually show that the uh, graviton is localized on this uh, 40 ends of the water brain? Uh, I mean, like in similar setups like cock randall uh, brainwood holography, it is very non trivial that the uh, higher dimensional graviton actually localized on this lower dimensional ends of the water brain. So, what's the case uh, like uh, in this yeah. kind of? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think in, um, sorry, in the, simple in the simple kind of setup with with only one boundary and um and this picture here then people have studied and sh- and shown that you can see gravel gravity localization directly um for yeah for this case that we're eventually considering um then at least the gravi- the g- the solution near the boundary uh should be just the same and and so at least um in this near boundary region then one should be able to uh, use the previous results. Uh, but so far we don't have a complete solution. Um, like I guess it would be nice to have a complete like microscopic solution for the case where the end of the world brain actually joins from one side to the other. And in that case, one would like to a- analyze the gravity localization to see if it persists. Uh, but we have not done that yet because we don't have the complete solution. Um, but I guess the, the argument would be that if I have a much smaller 40 central charge, um, then so so if I'm in a situation where um, the the five D geometry um, is is like highly curved or or um, maybe maybe not even um, geometrical, then uh, you, again you might you might say well really the, there's only there may not even be a, a 5D graviton um, in that case. So maybe, maybe it's, yeah. it's the full, the, the only uh, classical description is, is in the four dimensional part of the space time. And then it sort of would, would make sense that y- you, you have a, a very localized um, uh, physics on that 4D part. I see, that sounds natural. Thanks a lot. Thanks.
Okay, so uh, of course we have a, a online coffee gram after this, but if you have a still a quick question, maybe we can accept one or two. Okay, so if not, then let's, uh, if those who are interested to hold further discussion, please move on to this uh, special chat, which already, uh, this site is already put in uh, uh, this chat of this Zoom. Or well, also you, I think all of you got the email also for this account. This is a special chat, extreme universe. So, so uh, Mark, thank you very much for really wonderful talk. And let's thank again. Thank you. Thank you very much.